Residents of Salakope Amutinu in the Ketu South Municipality of the Volta region are counting their losses yet again following the latest tidal wave destruction that hit the area on Saturday. On Monday, the elders of the communities have had to undertake a reburial exercise for the remnants of dead bodies and earth from the cemetery by the destructive waves. Jechua News' Faisal Abdelidrisu has been in the affected communities and has come through with this report. So this morning we are back here in Salakope Amutinu, a conjoined community here in the Ketu South Municipality. Two of the four communities that have been affected by tidal wave incidents. Now this year alone, uh, there have been seven major tidal wave incidents that struck the communities. Many houses have been submerged, properties lost to the sea. On Saturday, another incident happened. About 40 households have been affected so far. We have been told that about 200 people have been displaced. All they have left for them is a church building where they now sleep. Interestingly, the sea has reclaimed part of the land again in Saturday's incident. And so from where I stand to the roadside, which is just about meters away, the sea on the other side, there is a vast land left now. But that is still not a safe place. We are standing right here at the cemetery where people have been buried. But there is one interesting twist to this whole issue. People who have been buried far in the past have had to be re-excavated. And what you are seeing behind me here is a process to get them re-buried. Buried. But I have the former assembly member and an elder of the community who would be telling me what exactly they have lost so far and what this process would be about. I cannot count my loss. They are a lot, uh, including my, 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 my brothers, my siblings. We, we, we were having a very mighty, mighty houses here. About 500 meters away, the sea has started coming to us. We have been running away, but now we are just on an island now. As I'm telling you now, we don't have even any food to eat. As I'm telling you now, because we, we cannot be able to go to sea. Our nets are lying, uh, lying idle here. You see? The sea is rough. You can't go. You, you, by going, you, you seek damaging your net and the canoe. We are, we are starving. We are thinking the government will come to our aid by now. But still, there's nothing going on. We don't understand. We, we don't know whether we are also Ghanaians or not. For those who are still surviving the tides, life is simply hopeless at the moment, as there is no help in sight. This issue of... Um, Tidal wave has gone beyond just the two communities. It is now a national threat. I say it is a national threat because the road that connects uh, Keta to Aplau will soon be affected. And soon the, the, the sea will gash into the river and will affect the main road that connects uh, Aplau to Keta. And we all know that the uh, Aplau border generates a lot of revenue to government. And so if nothing is done in time, to ensure that the, the sea defense war is extended to these communities, it's going to impact negatively on the country itself. In the interim, the MC for the area, Masol Kufi Lugudo, has announced plans to relocate the victims onto the lagoon side, while steps are taken to find a lasting solution. I already discussed with the regional uh, minister. As I said earlier on, as you were coming, you could see that you have to cross the lagoon in a way to, to, to reach here. So that is the first thing we, we are going to look for, to do, so that cars can come over, because the places have to be accessible to the people. Apart from that, uh, you could see that there is no electricity here, and there is no drinkable water, portable water here too. So those are the things we have to put in place as quickly as possible, because you can't put people here without those things. Where I stand is the proposed land, which is being made available for the affected residents to relocate to. But of course, this is a flat prone area. This is the lagoon side of the land. And so it is not easy for anybody to just move here and put up structures. The few you can see here, anytime it rains, they are in trouble. But the MCA has been assuring us that they will take steps to make the land suitable and fit for infrastructure purposes. Reporting here from Amutinu Salakopa and for J-Channels, my name is Faisal Abdul Idrisu.
Meanwhile, the executive director of the Volta Development Firm, VDF, Daniel Agboko Jagade, has described as heartbreaking the collective suffering by inhabitants in some communities in the Ketu South municipalities following the devastation caused by tidal waves. Now, the executive director, in a press statement, said the recent tidal waves have led to unfortunate incidences in some communities and called on government to take immediate action in finding solutions to short, medium and long term to help stop these unfortunate happenings. Now, he also went ahead to say, while empathizing with the victims, VDF is calling on government, the general public, especially citizens of the Volta region, to as a matter of urgency, uh, come on board to support demoralized victims with funds and relief items. VDF also recommends that government takes immediate action in finding immediate long-term medium and um, short-term solutions to the problem which has caused devastation to several households and affecting livelihoods. Joining us on phone is our Volta Regional Correspondent, Faisal abdul to bring us the latest update on the happenings in the Ketu South Municipality. Faisal, what's the latest update with regards to salvaging uh, and counting losses of residents in the Ketu South Municipality? Okay. Uh, yesterday, we were informed of uh, NADMO's arrival in Keta, where they brought some relief items to the affected uh, residents. They were not able to get into the Ketu South area. That is the Salakopo and Mutini yesterday. But this afternoon, when I crossed checked the assembly member for Salakofe and Mutini uh, indicated to me that they had sent the items yesterday, and this morning they joined them in person to distribute the items to the affected residents. As to the items they have lost in the sea, uh, these items are gone. The few they were able to salvage, those that they can actually dry under the sun, they are doing so at least uh, at the moment. And so uh, those who do not have a place to lay their heads, some are still putting up in the church building. Some are finding places outside the area. Some moving to Keta. Some moving to the Aflau area mm. to put up with families. And so this is the the, the latest development on the issue. Now, right. I am told. Fa Faisal, I'll, I'll ask you to kindly hold on for me while we engage the member of parliament for the area, Ablan Jifat Gomashi. Thank you very much for agreeing to speak to us tonight. Thank you for having me. Good right. Evening. Good evening to you. Now, how would you describe government's response so far? Because this is obviously a humanitarian crisis. I only heard a part of the, the question. I'm, I'm asking how you describe government's response so far to this humanitarian crisis. Well, it could be better. I mm. think that government could, could have done better and can still do better. Mm. Um... I am reliably informed that uh, some relief items have been sent. But if you look at the number of people who have been uh, hit by the tidal waves, then it's a drop in the ocean. It's welcome, but we could, we could have done better. Mm. I'm hoping that uh, this is what they have for now, and they are planning to bring some more relief items and hopefully also hear about when... Um, a temporary accommodation will be put in place for the, uh, the affected people and also um, see the realization of a promise that was made by the Minister for Works and Housing that we will see the beginning of the phase two of the sea defense. So mm. I, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful. Mm. Now, you talk about uh, moving them temporarily. Some people have called for the relocation of some of the residents in these communities. Is it feasible? Some people have called for what? They are calling for the total relocation of the residents from those areas. Is this feasible? Well, I mean, if, if uh, you know, we, we live by experience and mm. also we, we shift our sale. Um, to deal with a particular situation. Um, my experience or what I've learned is what happened in Qatar where the people relocated and then when the, uh, the accommodation was ready, it was reallocated to them. Um, that, that's, there's a possibility. Um, additionally, um, if that is what uh, works for government for now, why not? 
Um, I think that engaging the people and bringing them along to appreciate the need for them to move is, is, is also an option. But whatever the situation may be, in, in, in as much as... Time, so whatever we decide to do, we, we, let's get on with it. Mm. In as much as you want to engage the people to accept the issue of relocation, if need be, a lot of these people are fisher folk. What will be the alternative livelihood if they are eventually uh, relocated? Will all these things be factored? Well, I'm the one suggesting it. What I have suggested is that a temporary place be found for them. When we do the sea defense, we can bring them back where they, we, they have their... Um, they identify with the environment, they know what to do with it, go fishing, they, they have their source of livelihood from the sea. So that's my suggestion. What you asked me was what others are saying, and I'm not one of those people. I'm only saying that it's an option. It, it, it's a possibility. It can be done. But uh, to, to come back to the question, you know, in that area, uh, we have farming, uh, uh, farm produce, uh, we have fishing, and then we have the border. And, mm. you know, we, we grow up listening to the fact that if you don't have anything, where to be, I should tackle, you come back with something, meaning that once you cross the border, you come with something. Mm. So let's open the borders. They will find their, their, their source of livelihood. That's what they've done generation after generation. Generation after generation is what they know. They know how to fish. They know how to cross the border and, uh, and and come back with something. They know how to farm. But you see, those along the coast are not the ones who are into cassava farming, which I found to be one of the things you do very well in Inkatu South. But along the coast, you don't plant cassava. They plant coconuts, which they, they, they drink, and some is used for coconut oil. And then they go fishing, and they use it to fry the fish and sell or smoke it and sell. So that's what they're used to. Um, I, I don't know what alternative livelihoods are available um, for the people for now. Mm. So my suggestion strongly will be that the borders are open and allow them to do what they are used to doing. Uh, after all, our neighbors have opened their borders, and if it's COVID, we are in Accra. You and I are in Accra. Parliament is in Accra, uh, except for the parliament, uh, except for the, the floor of Parliament where. You're mandated to wear the mask. How many people are wearing a mask in in, in Accra in Kumasi and, and the rest of the cities in in Ghana? Why is it only uh, those who cross the border? And by the way, I've said on many platforms already that people are indeed crossing that road. Count the number of VIP buses that transport that leaves from terminals all over the country to Aplau on a daily basis. And I should tell you that something is going on. So my suggestion would be open the borders, let the people have their lives. Um, find them a temporary place, give them food mm. and clothing to wear, and f fix the, 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 the sea defense. Thank you for speaking to us. Abulaji Faguma, she's a member of parliament for the K2 South constituency. Let's still stay on this conversation. The director of research with the Center for Climate Change and Food Security, Isifu Suleiman, has joined us via Zoom uh, because he's far away, he's in Germany. Thank you for your time tonight, sir. Thank you. Thank you and good evening to your cherished viewers. Now, in twice a year, Keta has seen uh, destruction owing to tidal wave. Well, the Metro Agency says this is not tidal wave, but this one has been very devastating compared to previous ones. What is your assessment of the phenomenon? Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, um, GMET is right to say this is not a tidal wave. They say it's a storm surge. However, I mean, it's the same thing different in terms of the impact and consequences. Um, the main difference normally is what is leading to uh, each of the situations, either it is tidal waves or storm surge. So if you ask me what my assessment is, of course, now we know for a fact that um, this is the heaviest we've seen, I mean, in the last uh, couple of years, in the last 40 years. And for me, this is not new as someone who has been watching conversations and watching the trends about climate change. If you recall, Prior to COP26, um, the UN had actually issued a statement and saying that about 100 million people across the world are endangered as a result of climate change. And they specifically mentioned people who live on the coastal the lines and countries that are islands in nature. So the UN had already warned the world that uh, prior to COP26 that 
owing to the rise of the sea levels, unpredictable weather conditions, I mean, there is a likelihood that countries that live or people who live along coastal lines are going to be endangered. So I'm not surprised about what is happening. My surprise, however, stems from the fact that Ghana until now has not been able to develop early warning systems or early mm, warning mm. Uh, signals that will help us to um, foretell some of these things uh, before they even happen. Mm. I mean, this calls for a massive investment in science so that we'll be able to tell some of these things even before they happen. So in the interim, if you ask me what government has to do, of course, government has to relocate the people. But, I mean, to what extent would we be able to relocate 4,000 people, give them sufficient, um, uh, how do I call accommodation, and give them alternative sources of livelihood? I mean, this is a very, very big problem. So does, that, does, me, does, does it suggest that we are only approach. scratching the surface of the issue every time yes, it, for, it happens? Yes, for sure. I mean, this is, I mean, it was really laughable when I heard the minister saying that the second phase is going to be incorporated in the budget that is yet to be read by the finance minister. Mm. For how long have we known this problem? And what permanent solutions, strategic solutions have we put in place? I mean, if you look at the situation in Germany, you know for sure that for the first time, Germany uh, recorded flooding, which was, I mean, very huge because we had three months rain falling on the same day. But even Germany, with all the resources, it, it, resources at its dip- disposal, opened a fund. So I'm calling on government to open a fund to let people contribute to support the household because we have 4,000 people who have been displaced. And I'm wondering where government is going to find the money to sufficiently relocate these people and give them alternative livelihoods. So Mm -hmm. government should immediately open a fund, allow people to contribute to the fund in order to ameliorate the problem in the interim. The sea defense wall must go on. However, we know scientists are different as far as, I mean, even the viability and sustainability of sea defense wall is concerned. It can solve the problem. I mean, in the interim, but in the long run, when these go- when this government is not there or when this generation is no is no more, the sea defense war will not be able to stand the rising uh, sea levels that we are seeing across the globe. And mind you, Ghana living on the Ghana is hanging on the coast, and the scientists, I mean, the IPCC report, recent report, is calling, is asking that countries that live on the coast are are the worst in danger because sea level rise is very significant in the African uh, countries, especially countries that are hanging on the coast. So government must begin to think scientifically. And Mm. I've said this times without number. The interim approach of building the wall is good, I mean, to solve the problem in the interim. But Mm. let's develop early warning signs. Let's Let's invest more into science and be able to look at situations where we are going to provide solutions that are integrated in nature and not just produce, uh, give one off solution and then the problem will resurface after three years or five years when everybody has gone to sleep. Absolutely. Thank you very much for speaking to us, Isifu Suleimana. He's a director of research with the Center for Climate Change and Food Security. Uh, our correspondent is still on the phone. Faisal, thank you very much for holding the line for me. Uh, I'm sure you've had all the points made. There, I've seen reports where people say the issue of sand winning is one of the causative uh, agents to this tidal wave issue. How prevalent is tidal wave in those communities? Is there uh, sand winning? I beg your pardon. Well, uh, I let on the issue of sand winning not too long ago, mm. but the places I visited were far from the sea. Okay. Those were the areas in Katuno. It okay. was until this week that we went to Palakova that I have been told, and that is true because I've seen visuals from the site, especially around the Keta Puvama area, where people are engaged seriously in sun winning activities. The assembly at one point in time warned that any time they arrest people, they have chiefs and people of influence coming to beg for pardon for these people. And that going forward, when they are any of these persons engaged in sand winning, they would not in any way temper uh, mercy with justice. And so the issue of sand winning is very prevalent in these areas and 
could be a major factor. Except that in the Palakova Amusinu area, Sanguini is not happening. But when you go to the Keta area, where Fuvermen and then the Jita areas, which right. have been affected, mm. Sanguini is, is ongoing in those areas and could be another major factor in this whole issue. Thank you very much. Faisal Abdul Idris is an old uh, Volta regional correspondent. That has it for Insight, proudly brought to you by Pepsodent. Insights was sponsored by New Pepsodent Charcoal White Toothpaste containing activated charcoal to gently polish away tooth stains and naturally restore your smile. Now, elected members of parliament from the northern regions, led by the defense minister, Dominic Nitiul has assured the overlord of the Dagon Kingdom, Yana Abukari II, of the preparedness of the security agencies to deal with anyone who shall foment trouble in the region. The minister revealed that anyone who will use social media or any other medium to create any trouble among Dagombes and Konkombes will be arrested. Our northern regional correspondent, Noah Nash, filed the support. Recently, SFs of audio tapes making the rounds on social media purporting to incite violence among the Gumbes and Kunkumbes to fight was intercepted by the police. Two of the audio tapes revealed that Kunkumbes resolved to oppose the revision of the Dagbon constitution since it is against the Kunkumba community. This has heightened tension among the two ethnic groups on social media with a threat to engage in conflict. The situation has heightened the level of fear among various communities where both ethnic groups coexist in peace. The Defense Minister Dominic Nitu was leading a delegation of members of parliament, both minority and majority and security chiefs from the northern region, assured the overlord of the Dagbon Kingdom that they will search for the faceless individuals hiding under the cover of social media to incite violence among the Gombes and Kunkumbes in the region. The government has given the IGP the order to fish at all those who are monitoring the war and the conflict. We will go after those who are mongers, wherever they are, and fish them out. The ranking member on Parliament's Interior and Defence Committee, James Agaga, on behalf of the minority leader, said, without peace and tranquility, there cannot be development in the country since there is no NDC or MPP. We bear the brunt of that conflict. So many dear ones, friends, schoolmates, lost their lives in that conflict. In fact, there was no leader, there was no loser. And so we are very happy that His Royal Majesty, a very peace garden, um, over of our land, has assured us that he will do everything he can to ensure that there is peace in his kingdom and beyond. Still on security, the Minister for National Security, Albert Kandapa, has expressed concern about the myriad of insecurity concerns in the country and has further underscored the need to put together a national security strategy as a blueprint to forestall.